When you are in research, you have this great opportunity to be a never-ending learner. Welcome to Creative AI Conversations with me, Leah Coleman. In this interview series, we'll be chatting with prominent machine learning researchers and artists on their perspectives on Creative AI. Hi, I'm Shomadeep. I am a postdoc at the University of Washington. I finished my PhD at University of Maryland. So I have been in both East and West Coast. Uh, I have been working at the intersection of computer vision and graphics. And my goal is mainly to be able to democratize visual effects such that people can easily access these tools. And especially people who want to do creative stuff, but doesn't have the experience of say doing Photoshop or other difficult processes. Mm. How can we make their lives easier so that they can create things in a really easy way. So that's sort of a broader theme. And I've been looking into some particular techniques like green screening, relighting, some of the techniques that people need to use in everyday visual effects situ situation. And how can we sort of like democratize these effects such that everyone can have good access to those technologies. What is the future you envision if everyone has access or is able to do these high tech things? What I envision is like any average user, especially older users like my parents and people in that generation, we also be able to express their feelings, express their emotions through more artistic creation, more creative creations, who for now sort of feel a bit disconnect with the technology because oftentimes it requires a lot of careful editing and a lot of, lot of technical knowledges. And so in, in a lot of these works, what I try to do is like, what is, the, what is the basic human input a person can do that doesn't require knowledge of technology, but might require some physical movement, like, hey, move around with the flashlight or take an extra image of the background. So without requiring the technical knowledge of the process, how can you still let the people do it? So that's, that's kind of what I was thinking about. And I know like you're working with the UW Reality Lab and working with professors in the UW Reality Lab. So yeah, could you talk about the connection between democratizing like video editing and all of these tools to like the virtual reality and augmented reality world? When I did the background matting research, uh, a, a team of VR people in some companies reached out to me and their goal was like, people play a lot of VR games and there is like a lot of audience for that VR games. Now you want to replace the background and create something more interesting so that people watching the VR games feels like they're actually immersed. So now you sort of get two feed. One is the feed of the game and the feed of the person with the hand sizes and some stuff, right? It feels a little bit weird. So what if we could just compose that person into that 360 degree VR game feed such that it feels like you're actually watching a movie? Uh, the person might be wearing the headset still, but it would feel much more real and composited. And I, I never anticipated that when I worked on background matting or uh, green screening because it didn't seem like a direct application. But then chatting with these people and the way they are trying to use this technology, it seems like, wow, this could, this could totally transform a different kind of field in VR. Yeah, that's a really interesting use case. I, I wouldn't have thought of that either. Sometimes that, like you were mentioning, sometimes we do research and some use cases appear at the end that we never envision of. And that really makes me happy. Like, yeah, <laughs> using it in a very different way. From all of the research you've done and various papers you've published, um, including like the real time high resolution video matting, if you wanted to deep dive into one of them, which one would you want to talk about? Yeah, I would, I would probably pick the light stage paper because I kind of, it's more recent, but I'm also kind of really, it's, it's a really cool idea to me, like to actually use the screen lighting. So the idea of the light stage research and why that reaches is personally motivating is even before this, during my PhD, I worked on relighting and facial relighting. And especially I love movies. So I always wanted to create like, hey, can I take this movie lighting and put it on my face? while I'm on the Zoom call and make it really interesting. <laughs> so we were spending at that point in pandemic, we were spending a lot of time in front of our computer. And so during every meeting we were like, okay, we, can we do something about these situations that we are already in, which is spending so much time in front of the monitor. And it turns out that the monitor emits a lot of lighting and that lighting could be a huge cue to understand the relighting function of the face. 
So what we ended up proposing is, suppose if you're watching a YouTube video in a dark room on a monitor, the lighting source is just the monitor. And if you can capture the face, you basically know what is the lighting on the monitor and how your face appears under that particular kind of lighting. So you can get that kind of a paired data, which is the image on the monitor and the image of your face, which is the paired data of the lighting and the captured image. Now that's a great data. So once we have that, we can train machine learning models on top of that. The technical challenge, however, is people don't stay fixed. Like even if you ask them to, hey, don't move too much, <laughs> yeah, like, just yeah. look at YouTube video, they're inevitably going to move. Right. So the main challenge was handling that. And we had a different strategies. Like it's not one thing that worked, but we had to combine a multiple different stuff to make that work. So one of them is like what people use is this uh, GAN loss, basically an adversarial loss saying that the frequencies in that small patch of an image needs to look like the real, real image frequencies. This sort of helps you to get rid of uh, blurry images and make mm -hmm. more high frequency stuff. What we did to show that this works is, well, it's basically me watching YouTube videos over <laughs> a period of months. So over a month, I probably watched like 10 to 12 YouTube video every different day. While I was watching these videos, I was wearing different clothes. I had different beard level, depending on when I shave. Uh, I have a little bit different hairstyle. Yeah, you're gathering so diverse of, training data. Yeah, You've got a diverse training data of just you. You train on them, and then you test on a data that you have never seen. So this sort of taught me of creating this personalized AI models. Basically, it's just trained on this large imagery of me that you can naturally capture. And, and so, so, so think about it. We spend so much time in front of our webcam, in front of our phones, where we have our images. Why don't we utilize that images to learn just the model of ourselves on our side? We don't need to send these images to a cloud where we think about security and privacy. What if, if we have this whole personalized AI model kind of thing that just resides on our machine and just do editing for us? And we don't need to give that model to anyone. And everyone just sees the edited image of us. And so that's, that's kind of what came out of that project and what kind of really motivated me from this experiments that, yeah, we can probably build a personalized AI editing model. And it's it helpful in other ways. Like, for example, I've been working on many of these editing applications. One issue is how do we make these algorithms generalized to any skin color? That has always been an issue because the training data are biased. And it's not even clear if you unbiased the training data, if the problem would be outright solved. Do you think personalization is the route forward? I guess this personalized AI model for this kind of graphical editing is something that I'm excited about and have started to think and formulate problems along that direction. But there are some other stuff I'm excited about and started to look for collaboration, which goes a little bit beyond creative AI, which is I have these tools that can understand lighting, that can understand these effects, physical effects. And so I, I'm a bit interested nowadays in non-contact health monitoring, like more of AI mm -hmm. for healthcare kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And the idea is I have been working, I have been chatting with these folks with, from Microsoft Research and UW, and they have been creating these amazing tools where people can sit in front of the webcam and they can take a continuous video and they can estimate the pulse rate, they can estimate blood oxygen level, all of this without requiring a sensor. And the idea is if, if, if it requires a sensor, it still senses from one point on your face or your body. Whereas with the video, it can sense from multiple locations on your face, mm -hmm. but it's much more noisy. So what they were able to show is this method works when it is trained on say, in a very constrained capture setup and tested on the same constraints capture setup. So in short, it doesn't generalize to any kind of lighting condition. It doesn't generalize outside of that experimental setup. So the reason of that collaboration, what I'm excited about is we learned about, we understand the lighting from graphics point of view and how do we take this kind of, uh, this kind of tools and help this AI for sensing kind of technologies be more robust to the real world situations. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not a super expert, but if I'm not shaving every day, just my skin appearance and the signal that it emits would change. So how do you handle those kind of situations in real practical life 
is going to be a real challenge. And that's, that's kind of one thing that I'm excited because I, I sort of feel like in future, I also want to, so creative AI is very personal. I have been working on it, but I also feel like I want to take this ideas of creative AI and see how I can apply this to healthcare and improve human lives. It's very important to yeah, expand that bubble to the rest of the human population um, in order, especially like when it comes to healthcare. Exactly. I guess switching to devil's advocate type of people, have you encountered people who um, are skeptics about your research areas or like the directions you're going in and like, what do they say and what are your, what's your counter to it? People in general are nowadays more skeptical about any AI tools for editing. And obviously the most questions that I face from people is, well, wouldn't that create deep fake? Uh, and, and the concern is le- legit. I wouldn't discount, discount their concerns. Uh, sometimes I try to give them a little bit more historical perspective, which is, well, look, AI for editing has been, not AI, just editing, just computational photography has been there for like 100 years. People have used for creating fake tools. But the problem is, the real problem is we are democratizing this technology, which means the fake would also be democratized pretty quickly. How much of the onus is on the viewer and the participant in like believing it and how much is on the researcher educating everyone about the dangers of it? The people creating deepfake videos are basically trying to stoke your fears. So people, the viewer side, they're never going to check. They already believe in their mind that something like this could happen. And all they need is a single video to sort of show that this, this is real. And then they would forward it to like 10, 15 people. And this would, this would keep on happening. This would keep on expanding. So I think a lot of viewers doesn't care to check if the video is real or not. They already have a stereotype in mind. And if the video conforms to that, they're happy to accept it, even if it doesn't feel real. Okay, this is getting, getting to a, a big question of who or what inspires you in your work and in your life? One of my personal inspiration in research has been sort of my mentor and my long-term friend, Anju Kanajawa. And she has been like now a faculty at Berkeley. She was a senior PhD student with me in Maryland and sort of my personal mentor and coach. And, you know, and she has been a really inspiring figure who really inspired me to come this far and helped me a lot when I am stuck and kind of feeling down. So having those kind of people in your research life really helps. And of course, the personal family life, like my parents, my wife, all of them mm-hmm. have been really supportive. So what yeah. I find passionate is, can I, can I take what I have learned and sort of slowly move into a new different area and learn more about it? It's like when you are in research, you have this great opportunity to be a never ending learner. Like you can keep on learning and no one would frown upon it. Like, I'm not sure how much that is possible in other areas, but people who have done that in my research field and in my areas are are really someone who inspires me. What is your dream project? And then also, yeah, feel free to add on anything you missed or anything else you'd like to share. That's a big question. What's <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't call about a dream project, but it's like more of what things that you want to advance that that would make you happy and. So far, my bet on my future research has been in this, in creating this kind of a personalized AI systems. And it's kind of a long shot bet in a sense that it might take a few years to get to that point. And hopefully by that time, a lot of people will have machines with GPUs in itself. Like a lot of the modern day laptops are already coming with really, really good processors and GPUs and they're really powerful machines. So. Hopefully in five years, we will have all the technologies that we need and hopefully it will become a reality to have some kind of personalized models for, for some cases. So, so that's, that's one thing that motivates me. Another thing that I have been particularly thinking about is our video conferencing experience in last two years have been great, but it has really, really not been up to real life experiences. We have in, evolved in the sense the speed has become better, the picture quality has become better, uh, maybe we can replace the backgrounds now, but it still doesn't feel like talking to the same to a person in the same room. Uh, 
And some of the things that I'm really interested in working on is, for example, when, I'm, when I talk to you, sometimes my gaze is on your face and sometimes it's not. We use eye contact to express things, to express interaction. Some of the things that I'm excited about and working on and thinking on is how do we be make better interfaces? And it's not just a vision problem, it's more of the HCI visualization problem. But can we, of course, I think the ultimate goal is we want to have this VR world where we can video conference calls and chat with everyone and feels like real life interactions. That's, that's something that I think would be really exciting. But again, VR would take more time to go there. I'm not sure how, more, how much democratizing it will be. I'm not sure if my parents in India will ever get to use VR. Uh, and even if VR is cheap, it's just they wouldn't be they wouldn't be comfortable with that experience. They would not know what to do with that experience. So that's why I'm still still betting more on just our regular video conference setup because that requires just a mobile phone and everyone in the world, not everyone, but a large chunk of the population has a mobile phone. Yeah, yeah, and that's what's here already. And there's no need to re like re-communicate or re-educate of like here's the new interface of this headset and it's heavy and all this stuff. Yeah, so that's that's another direction that I'm really excited about to to sort of build the future of video conferencing. And it kind of goes hand in hand. I sort of feel like the future of video conferencing would involve some form of personalized AI that sits on my side doing this editing on my face as I talk to you to make me look good. And similar from your side, there would be your AI that is making you look good as you're talking with me. Is there anything I missed or anything else you'd like to share? Well, I guess I guess that's all that I wanted to share. It has been, yeah, it has been really nice to, I, I, to naturally talk about these things and have the thoughts come out and flow. I'm not a, I'm not a huge communicator, but I, I hope I tried my best. No, you've been great. Yeah, it's been, it's been all very like understandable and natural and yeah I really love chatting with you about your research and your views on yeah on the field and on the world and where this where this is going in the future.